the Bear Gulch limestone is a wonderland of ancient fish proportions. Yeah, its heyday was the time of the giant bugs, but the Bear Gulch shows that there were just as many wacky biological shenanigans going on in the oceans. Fish with giant bulbous heads, unicorn sharks that were not sharks, ratfish relatives with jaws full of saws, and one particularly bizarre little freak whose males carried around a pair of sexy stalks they could swing around for all to see. Come, let's meet Harpago Futator. The cartilaginous fish, which is scientifically referred to as the chondrichthys order, is a vast group of fishy creatures with no hard calcified bones in the majority of their skeletons. Today, this group includes the sharks, rays, skates, sawfishes, ratfishes, and chimeras. This group used to be far more diverse during the periods of time known as the Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian, from 419 to 250 million years ago. Obviously, there were plenty of weird interesting oddities during the Mesozoic era, but the vast majority of the bizarre branches are found in those three periods of time before the Mesozoic era. There are a handful of exceptional fossil sites throughout the world that preserve what life was like in the oceans of these periods of time, and one of the best happens to be the Bear Gulch Limestone. The Bear Gulch limestone is what is referred to by rock nerds as a geological lens, which is a body of ore or rock that is thick as a snicker in the middle and thin like crisps at the edges, pretty much resembling a convex lens, hence the stupid simple name I already explained to you. So a big old bean shaped chunk of rock that is distinct from the rocks around it. The Bear Gulch limestone is located in central Montana and dates to the late Mississippian subperiod, about 358 the 323 million years ago. It's the first chunk of what normal people call the Carboniferous period. This lens of rock is scantily exposed over a number of outcrops northeast of the big snowy mountains, notorious for being quite large, mountainous, and snowy. No one said they had to be original with that one. What's so special about this lens of rock is that it is considered what the increasingly verbose Germans call a Lagerstatt. No matter how many Germans I get to explain the pronunciation of that word to me, nor how many times I run it through Google Translate, there will always be someone saying I said it wrong despite the inherent arbitrariety of pronunciations. We all know what we are referring to whether we say Deinonychus or Deinonychus. Digression aside, a Lagastata is a sedimentary deposit that preserves whatever died in the area so well that soft tissues can remain on the corpse. Of course, much to the ignorant and arrogant creationist or science denier's dismay, those soft tissues are either impressions in the sediment or are replaced by minerals just like the rest of the skeleton. So no longer soft, soft tissues. Within this 30 to 40 meter thick Montanan bean-shaped lens of ancient rock, thousands of specimens of over 150 species of fish, as well as plenty of invertebrates, have been excavated and described over the last 50 or so years by Richard Lund and Eileen Grogan, but also through the activities of local ranchers and a few scientists that trekked out to the ledges of the limestone throughout the first half of the 1900s. In 1982, Richard Lund published a paper in the Journal of Paleontology on a suite of specimens of a bizarre, lungfish-like cartilaginous fish found in the Bear Gulch from 1968 till 1994. The most recent count of specimens from this critter is 89, but that was at least 20 years ago, so there's probably more now. These fish are generally characterized by a long, flat eel or lungfish-like body with a short frill of a fin that starts right after the pectoral fins and carries on down the center of the tail to the base of the pelvic fins. As such, they also have the usual pectoral and pelvic fins but seem to lack any form of anal fins or dorsal fins. These critters had a low, wide skull that superficially looks almost reptilian or even duck-like to an idiot like me, but also shares some convergent similarities to all sorts of bizarre, non-cartilaginous fish alive with us today. Their eyes were relatively small. Their teeth were something unusual as well. If we take a closer look, we will see that the dentition is of various tooth plates. The front ones are smaller than the single large back pairs and a mandibular symphysial plate is present in the middle. Lund decided to call these freaky fish Arpagofutator vocellorhinus. 
from Harpagos for grappling hook, Fugitor for copulator, Volcellus for pinchers, and Rhinus referring to nose or snout. So the pincer snouted grappling hook copulator. The weirdest part of these fish anatomy are up next on our analysis, and it has to be weird for a name like this. So many specimens of Harpago Fugitor have been found that growth stages and both sexes can be determined. Some are even found with embryos in their bodies. Thanks to cartilaginous fish having external visible genitalia in the form of claspers, one can determine the sex of these fish relatively easily. However, Harpago Fugitor is a special case because the males are some of the most bizarre of any fish ever found. Unlike pretty much most cartilaginous fish and unlike those found in the Bear Gulch, Harpago Fugitor is scaleless. Well, mostly. Only the males have scales, but only in weird lines along the lateral line, which is a system of sensory organs found in fish, used to detect movement, vibration, and pressure gradients in the surrounding water. This is where the fun begins. Unlike any chordate so far known to science, adult male Harpago Fugitor had a pair of sockets in their skulls that housed a pair of further articulated branched antler-like structures. These things stuck out up and backwards at a near 90 degree angle, but they had joints so they could presumably move on their own. They were attached to a part of the skull known as the ethmoid region. In humans, the ethmoid is an unpaired bone in the skull that separates our nasal cavity from the brain. It's located at the roof of the nose and between the two orbits. Now, obviously we are far removed from Harpago Fugitor, but it is interesting to see how this bone is so much more important to this animal than it is to us. The first segment of the antlers is the longest, somewhat curved and expanded at the end. It extends past the back edge of the orbit. Two shorter segments articulate by well-developed joints with the far end of the first segment. What appears to be the more mesial of these is thinner, tapers at the end and articulates at its far end with a terminal tapered element. The end is forked with the two tines covered in a line of thick bottomed denticles or spiny scales. Richard Lund refers to these antlered appendages as claspers, ethmoid claspers specifically. As I was reading, I wondered to myself how anyone could know these were claspers. For those scratching their heads, a clasper is a male anatomical structure found in some groups of animals used in mating. Male cartilaginous fish have claspers formed from the posterior portion of their pelvic fin, which serves to channel semen into the female's cloaca during mating. So, not quite a penis, but also not not one if you catch my drift. Chimeras, the second half of the living Gundrichthians, are of course way weirder than the shark's rays and skates, in that the males have retractable sexual appendages called tentacula to assist mating. The frontal tentaculum, a bulbous rod which extends out of the forehead, is used to clutch the female's pectoral fins during mating. They also have the normal pelvic claspers and less normal claspers in front of the pelvis. Yeah, so some of these guys have tentacles sticking out of their heads used to hold on to their lady friends. Since that's their use, I doubt they secrete the good stuff, so calling them claspers when the actual baby batter delivery system is called a clasper seems a little confusing, but whatever, I'm not a marine biologist. So, the ethmoid claspers of Harpago Fugitor are substantial external structures with heavily calcified walls and well-defined joints, implying an intrinsic system of muscles or ligaments as well as extrinsic musculature for erecting and depressing the claspers as well as opening and closing the articulated end bits. While the conclusion is inescapable that the ethmoid claspers had to play a critical role in mating, the evolutionary pathway leading to their development is enigmatic. Before we move on, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a good idea about how big these little weirdos are. Based on the largest specimen of Harpago Fugitor found, these fish can get up to 170 millimeters or about 7 inches in length. They're pretty much just a measly little snack. Thanks, Mr. Man. Now, oddly enough, Harpago Fugitor is not the only cartilage-spined lungfish copycat from the Carboniferous period. Scottish paleontologist Ramsey Turcair named another fishy beast Chondron Kellys from the Glencarthon volcanic beds of the upper border group of Scotland. This one doesn't have the male-specific antlers. 
Turns out, Kondrin Kellys and Harpago Futator are each other's closest relatives, fitting within their own family, the Kondrin Kellyidae, and their own order, the Kondrin Kellyiformes, as a floating, unplaceable group within the greater Kondrichthys class. Both Kondrin Kellys and Harpago Futator possess strong male secondary sexual characteristics, and as far as can be determined, have equal sized males and females. Of the few known specimens of Chondrin Kellys, four are males and two are females. There is a maximum of nine male Harpago Futator and a minimum of 15 females among well-preserved specimens of over 16 mm head length. It is also probable that of the remaining incomplete specimens of over 16 mm head length, six are females, giving a ratio of males to females of approximately one to two. In Chondrin Kellys, the pectoral fins of the males are enlarged, with hypertrophied radial bones. They are devoid of denticles and would seem to serve relatively little practical function in any other way but for display and courtship. Their swimming efficiency would not be improved. The principal secondary sexual characters of male Harpago Futator are the ethmoid claspers and the cranial, lateral, and pelvic denticles. Each clasper is large, mobile, structurally stronger than prismatic calcified cartilage, and heavily denticulated. They are calcified with considerably thick walls, suggesting that they were adapted to stresses beyond those encountered in either the claspers or the hypertrophied pectoral fins of male chondrin kellys. While a display function can be assumed in view of the alteration in body form produced, display alone might be better enhanced by increased surface area than by structural strength. There is no evidence for a membrane between the branches of the claspers that would accentuate this function, and the joints suggest they could be moved, which sort of excludes a membrane. A feeding function seems improbable since they seem to always be directed backwards and don't seem to be able to be moved at their ends. Richard Lund, therefore, suggested that the ethmoid claspers, like all the funky go-go gadget fidget toys of the chimeras of today, may have served, in part, to hold females during sexy times. Among modern elasmobranchs, males have been reported to hold the pectoral or dorsal fin of females with their jaws during copulation. That's a lot more fun in a primal sort of way, but seems like not so much fun for critters with jaws of razor blades. Though the literature on sharky sexy times has certainly improved since the publication of Harpago Fugitor by Lund, it could still use some help, and is still restricted to some courtship displays and chemical soup stimulants. There aren't much of any strong and obvious sexual characteristics among the living elasmobranch fish, not a single peacock among them. Structures modified for display and courtship among other male animals, however, are extremely common, whether they be male breeding colors, teeth, or more elaborate and more permanent changes in fin or body form. That male display structures may function in courtship does not preclude their use in agnostic or anti-predator display. On the contrary, other social functions are common and would serve to increase their potential selective value. An elephant uses its tusks for display, as well as a tool, and for killing things. The male-to-female ratio of 1 to 2 in Harpago Fugitor, with approximately equal-sized males and females, contrasts with other cases of sexual dimorphism among the Bear Gulch Chondrichthys, Echinochimera, Falcatus, and Damocles, all of which have high male-to-female ratios and elaborately developed male display structures, fit male display models of sexual selection associated either with gregariousness, high population density, or with mating aggregations. Further, while data for chondrin kellys are very scant, the high number of known males also may fit this category. It can only be suggested that sexual selection in Harpago Futator seems to have resulted in an opposite trend, specifically fewer, possibly more mobile males and selection for more effective copulatory devices. They like to make love real good. It is not unusual to find fossilized soft tissue pigments in the fishes of the Upper Mississippian Bear Gulch limestone. Lund, led by Eileen Grogan, published another paper in 1997 on the soft tissues preserved in the huge number of Harpago Fugitor specimens as they seem to preserve pigments. Evidence is preserved, most commonly, on the venous circulation, cardiac tissue, and skin pigmentation. 
The internal pigments preserved in the orbital, branchial, and abdominal regions of bare gulch chondrichthians are most likely hemoglobin-derived, iron-rich routes of venous circulation. They reflect a course of venous circulation that is virtually identical to that known in certain living cartilaginous fish, and includes circulation that supplied reproductive and digestive tissues. Venous blood pigments are preserved over arterial pigments, solely because of distinctive differences in vessel design. Venous elements in chondrichthys are spacious, thin-walled, and valved structures that are subject to the pooling of large amounts of blood. In contrast, arterial vessels are thick-walled, unvalved, and retain far smaller quantities of blood. Lund had, in 1982, reported a blind sac in Harpagophutator as some form of intestinal cecum, or digestive gland. The 1997 paper reinterpreted it as a spleen due to its position, shape, and the pigments preserved. The structure previously described as a spiral-valved posterior intestine was also reinterpreted as remnants of reproductive tissue vascularization. By comparison with living selachians and chimerids, this identification infers the preservation of either a gonadal sinus or a seminal vesicle and spermatophore packaging apparatus, and further infers that the type specimen was a sexually mature male that died during breeding season. This study also supports the hypothesis that the Berigolch fishes were subject to periodic catastrophic events that, in regard to preservational detail, only are accounted for by asphyxiation. The preservation of internal organs and venous system pigments in a tropical climate requires that death and burial were either simultaneous or separated only by a matter of hours. Moreover, the occurrence of fossil abdominal vessel pathways indicates that the time between death and burial was so limited that vascular necrosis and the diffusion of the blood pigments could not occur. Conditions that produced detached turbidity currents, which are hypothesized to account for the sedimentation of the Bear Gulch limestone, not only account for observations of pathology in some fish, but also seem to be necessary for the preservation of the vascular patterns detailed by the pigments. Based on the sedimentology of the Bear Gulch, the climate indicators, and all the critters and plants preserved in it, many experts have hypothesized that the area was an estuarine bay. When the bay was in its heyday, there was a tremendous diversity of tropical fish and invertebrates such as the world-toothed Eugeniodontids, a bunch of hard-shell cracking fish known as petalodontiforms, and tenaid, shark-shaped holocephalins like Falcatus and Damocles, the iconic ironing board sharks, long ribbon fish or eel-like forms, the bizarre, enigmatic Delphiodontos, the even more enigmatic furry-scaled eel shark Lystracanthus, flying fish-like Ineopterygians, some ray-finned fish, spiny sharks, coelacanths, proto-horseshoe crabs, shrimps, bivalves, cephalopods, gastropods, worms, brachiopods, and much more. It was a veritable smorgasbord of tropical bay residents all living together 320 million some odd years ago, with a huge number of antlered freaks wriggling around in the muck, looking for worms and figuring out how to make babies real good. Could there be even wackier fish out there waiting to be discovered? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.